VIP access. VIP access with Aniko and Africa Loud. Welcome to VIP Access. This is episode four of my podcast and YouTube show that has been in existence from 2018. The concept of this podcast is meeting with various artists and creatives from across the continent. I'm coming to you this week from Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm happy to be speaking to an artist who originally comes from Lesotho. She's the one who brings restoration. She will be telling us about the meaning of her name, the meaning of her art and craft and why she thinks it's very important to remain authentic to yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Leo Mile. Hi, that was such a lovely introduction. <laughs> so glad you like it because before this I had to redo it to make myself happy. So if you're happy, then I'm double happy. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well, a little medicated <laughs> and nasal from flu, but otherwise I'm great. Yeah. I know you're experiencing a little sore throat or a big sore throat. And I'm like, why is this always affecting the artist? Is it because you're using your vocal cords more than we do? But I always find a lot of artists having a lot of throat issues. You know, I actually don't know. I It's been so strange for me because over the past year, without fail, when I have a show coming up, I've been getting flu. <laughs> and so I have a show coming up on Friday and I'm flu again, so I don't know. But perhaps in general, yes, um, musicians do exercise their throats a bit more than the average person. Yeah. So yeah, maybe. Okay, it's really great to you know meet you in person and to be able to talk to you about your music, your career, and um, you know everything you're doing in the industry. So maybe first things first, tell me about um, your journey from Lesotho to South Africa, or why you you're actually born in Lesotho, and at what point did you um, you know come to South Africa and um, not come to South Africa but decide to reside in South Africa? Let me say it that way. Right. So initially I came to South Africa to study, um, to pursue my undergrad. Mm -hmm. And because I wanted to do something that was, I wanted to do film actually. <laughs> so there was no film school in Lesotho. Yeah. And so I came to Johannesburg to pursue film. And then along the way I found music. Well, I've always had music, but uh, I think music kind of um, called out to me as something that I needed to pay attention to. And when I started paying attention, then I eventually changed courses completely. And I, end I ended up studying um, music live performance instead of film. So once I was here, it made sense for me to stay here just because as much as it's really lovely and important to build and establish industries um, where I was at the time, I wanted to be able to exercise my art, uh, my art and not necessarily be forced to build the infrastructure to support that, right? Mm -hmm. And so Lesotho has got a very budding kind of in its early stage, infant stages, music industry. And so it just made sense for me to be here while of course still I perform home I perform back at home quite often and I'm also involved in like music workshops and that um kind of stuff. But I do find that South Africa has a, the kind of infrastructure that can support me better where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I find your music, you know, so beautiful um, and uh, like uh, music, music that I want to see uh, live. And it's because of how you mash up, you know, different influences, different sounds from traditional folk music to neo soul to jazzy to R&B. Could you tell, talk to me about um, how you interpret your music and where you get some of these inspirations from? from because when you when I listen to your music it's almost like an old soul singing then when I met you I'm like oh my gosh she's so she's so tiny and so young but the music is so rich tell me more about the inspirations that's so interesting I get that quite a lot it's like sometimes, right? sometimes I've been booked for shows and when I arrive they think I'm part of like the team uh, of the and they're like oh okay um where's Leo Mila and I'm like this is her. <laughs> yeah, like, where's the boss? So, like, it's me. It's because they're expecting a much older woman with just like, I guess, like a, I don't know, <laughs> a bigger uh, body and presence. Um, uh, but um, I do think that 
it's something that I'm actually trying to lean more into, just allowing myself to flow and be in between genres because I think I was influenced by a lot of different styles of music, right? And I think that's what kind of expresses when I'm writing as well, all of these um, influences coming together. And at first I used to fight it quite a lot because I wanted so much to have a what you would call like a distinct identity. And I also had kind of heard um, this narrative that that's what people need in order to relate to you, right? A very distinct kind of um, identity that's going to um, resonate with a, a certain subculture, you know? And while those things are true, um, I do think that ultimately being truthful is, you know, the best way to resonate. And so I just try and honor that. And in terms of the, the old soul, um, yeah, I do find that, um, I, I do think that there's an aspect of cultural work or a cultural worker inside, in me. And that's partly why I very intentionally, uh, pursued writing music in, in Sesotho. And so I like to think that because I go on that path, I'm kind of collaborating with like, with the ancestors. And I do think that comes through the sense of like an ancient language, right? When you, when you sing the music of old, when you sing in a particular language, I think that 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 ancient that's what maybe people are hearing when they feel that old soul in the music <laughs> oh my god it's so crazy because when you explain it it makes sense but like from 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 a listener perspective i don't know this like you're telling me now but when i put the two and two together it makes absolute sense that's so crazy <gasps> oh my god i'm glad it checks out i'm glad the evidence <laughs> what i'm saying and the actual evidence of your experience yeah and also t talk to me then about more of the cultural work you do and how you know there's for you there's always an intersection between the culture and Afri african tradition and the music because um your name even has a very strong meaning like the one who brings restoration do you feel very connected to your name and um you know just tell me about you know the different intersections between your identity and how you interpret culture into the music yeah I do. I um um I do think that my name and the work that I do is actually quite related because um growing up and even right before I started kind of seriously paying attention to my musical gift um I always felt alienated or and I couldn't really articulate what this alienation was, uh, right? Because I grew up in Lesotho, so we speak predominantly Sesotho and a lot of the culture has been preserved, but in a lot of ways, the culture has been eroded as well, right? And so I couldn't really articulate this thing that I was kind of searching for that I think is the eroded culture, right? You know, there's so much of what we did that was like community-based and all these practices and just ancient ways of being that were eroded. And so I, when I started writing in Sesotho, again, I, I didn't really know where that urge was coming from, but I just felt a strong urge. And when I started to pursue that, then... I realized that like as much as, you know, I am this global citizen, very much able to function in different parts of the world. And I appreciate that there's this aspect of myself and my history and my family that I'm yearning to connect to. And I think a lot of us, especially, um, right now at this place, this place and time where we are as Africans are yearning for that because, um, when Western culture was brought here, there was the sense that it was going to liberate, right? And a lot of people took to it from that place and wanted to abandon, it, you know, all the old to get into this new place. And now where we are now, we're like, hmm, okay, there's a, there's a beauty that we can kind of connect with the rest of the world. Um, but there's also a lot that we lost. Mm -hmm. So I do think that for personal reasons, I'm pursuing, I'm pursuing that restoration. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the cultural work is. It's just yes. like really interrogating which parts of ourselves were, um, beautiful and beneficial and what did we let go of that we are now yearning to reclaim and yeah re-exist in so yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, i mean like for instance even what, what are the what are our traditional way, ways of um defining our own selves because i feel like with the westernization came a lot of definition as to this is what beauty should look like right. this is how your hair should right. be this is how you should sound right. but it, it, when it comes to identity it's just like there's so many ways of um of, of defining what it is beauty is that right. you know was stolen away from us and it's for us to come back and appreciate our own selves and even our own languages yes absolutely and see ourselves i think when we 
when we, we, we see ourselves from this external gaze, right? Like you're saying, these, these ideas of beauty, these definitions of being that have been given to us, then we constantly see ourselves from outside ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. And we're constantly trying to make self of ourselves from the perspective of how someone else saw us. So part of this reclamation is being able to kind of define ourselves for ourselves and mm-hmm. see ourselves, right? In our, just in our beingness and not feel this need to exist and alter ourselves to accommodate this external gaze. Exactly. Yeah. Is this part of the reason why you also predominantly sing, not just in um, English, but also in your traditional language? Um, and in terms of singing in your traditional language, which you'll tell me what the, la- what, what you call the language, um, did that always come natural to you? Um, or did you act- acquire it at a later stage in your life? Oh my goodness, I am still acquiring it. (laughs) Aren't we all? Me too. (laughs) Yes, I'm still acquiring it as much as I do think I have a little slight advantage that I grew up in Lesotho. So, you know, we do speak quite a bit of Sesotho. But I will say that not being able to consume art that was created in Sesotho, even though it's a language that I spoke, there was kind of a gap for me that I needed to bridge between like, it's the language that I speak at home and it's a language that can create art as well, right? So I'm still bridging that gap and I actually find that I create in terms of songwriting I write more naturally in English than in Sesotho Mm -hmm. like writing in Sesotho for me requires a bit more like stillness intentionality listening altering I'll call my father sometimes and be like oh no like I know that there's a phrase that says this or like a you know um yeah a phrase that says this but I can't remember what the exact words are and then he'll kind of edit for me in that way so it's very intentional that I yeah that I write in Sesotho so sp- speaking of which, um, you talk about, you know, s- sending your dad songs. Tell me about growing up, you know, in a musical family, because both your dad and mom are musicians. Um, you know, how did this influence you? It must have influenced you positively or you might have found yourself, you know, singing or being accepted as a musician from an early age. Um, how was that experience like? So they are both musical, but not necessarily. They're both I, I guess they're musicians at heart, but both of them did not pursue music, uh, right? They didn't pursue music uh, like professionally. So yes, my mother is a singer. My grandmother before her was a singer as well. They both, you know, would lead a church at school. My mom would also always be called up to lead the assembly song or that. And she says now, I, th- I think it's something she never really emphasized when I was growing up. But now she says, I, I actually really wanted to pursue it, but it just, it, it wasn't even, it didn't seem like a possibility, or, you know, it, uh, so she, she didn't pursue it. And then my father also is just a music enthusiast. So he collected a lot of music and played music on his record player for us growing up. So I think that kept the music very near to me, right? And kind of, um, in some ways, just influenced and cultivated that love for music. And I think it was always running through my veins anyway. And yes, now I get to draw from that. When I speak of these various influences, I think, you know, growing up, our parents would listen to a lot of, um, I think, especially during apartheid time, right? So they would play like an English song and then they would play an African song or an English song, an African song, even on Bantu radio or like black radio stations, right? Mm-hmm. So they had this sense of what was going on, of the sound, that international sound, that American sound, that, you know, um, English sound or European sound as well. And so growing up, my father had this, this, this weird, strange, varied <laughs> music taste and like country music here or some bands that he discovered when he was in Australia. And now he likes, so, um, yeah, I just think it adds to my varied music taste. And when you ended up being this um, musician, is that something that, you know, made them proud? Was that something they were expecting? Did they support you fully even up to the point where you went to study? Um, you actually have a, a degree in the Bachelor of Arts, but you studied performing live music. Yes. Wow, that's so specific. It is. <laughs> and the, the interesting thing is that when I got to the university in my first year, that was the year that they introduced that course. So there was no music course before. I went to a film school and there was no music course before. So that was the year when they introduced it. And I did a bit of film and I did a bit of that. And then, excuse me, I realized, I think I'm drawn to this music more. So then I had to go back and explain, I know you guys thought I'm going to study film, but you know, I think they're in the same arena. So for the fact that they were okay with me studying film already, um, I think they were open. They just needed to understand what's happening, what the motivation is. And I just told them that 
I'm really, I'm, I'm just feel drawn to this more than the film. Um, I had an idea of what studying film would be. And I guess I, I always just wanted to tell stories. And that was the medium, the closest, me, the medium that felt, um, that felt right at the time, right? Uh, but I also had an idea of what like making films would be. And then when I had the experience of being in a film school and studying music and live performance, I realized mm, my medium right now at least is this one is the music mm -hmm. so they were very they were very supportive and very receptive actually mm -hmm. fantastic um i want to take you back to your debut album um what's the first name molomo it's pula molomo pula molomo yeah. and what does pula molomo mean so pula molomo is i guess it loosely translates to the offering right um it, what it actually is is when during bridal negotiations, um, if one family wants to approach the other family to say our our son is interested in your daughter, traditionally they would uh, take an offering of a cow, and that initial cow that they use to um, init to start the negotiations is called bulamolom, right? So it is this. It's it's this because it was my introduction to the world musically i love it <laughs> you see the poetry i see i do see i do see and i was gonna ask like you know how how did this you know drop of this debut album you know pan out for you because i feel like it's very important for artists to put out um a project because and especially the first project because you want to show you know people like this is who i am mm -hmm. these are the different sounds or this is my inspiration at the moment this is what makes me who i am and uh when you talk about it that way i then see that you were preparing to show the world like this is the gift that i'm giving you before you're able to take me <laughs> <laughs> yes and i'm really grateful to be honest at the time when i put out my first album there was i was pressured by my family because they were like you have this repertoire of music that you keep performing but we think you need to pa you know to uh, to, to package it yes and record this moment in time as well and the perfectionist in me kept saying no my sound is still evolving i just like i don't think i found it yet and they were like it's okay but like we like what you have right now and we really think it's important to capture that and now in hindsight i'm so glad because i think we never stop evolving as artists and so the albums are meant to capture the different mm -hmm. moments in time so mm -hmm. yes I, i'm very grateful for that pressure even though i felt like i'm not ready yet um to put out that offering and yes i think that even that the album name says kind of has like a in a it, it, it says it's open-ended. It's very much like this is the beginning. Yes. This is where we start, yes. yes. And in terms of where you want to go, you know, with your career, um, what's the vision? What's, what, what, what would you like to achieve? What kind of music do you want to continue making? I think you already spoke about the fact that the, as artists and as people, we will always evolve. Mm -hmm. um, at this point in time, what kind of sounds are you feeling? What do you feel are the new inspirations that you've um, added into your sound or your way of making and interpreting music? Mm -hmm. So, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so many things at once right now. I love it. <laughs> I'm many, many things at once right now. I do think after that album, um, I, I did lean more into exploring the folk sound. I think... The Pulamolomo is very much a traditional album because of the language and the stories in, in the music. But I do think sonically it's more kind of soulful jazz. It's got a lot of modern instruments. And I think, um, then the music that followed, um, is leaning a little more to the folk kind of stripped down. Um, I also really am curious. I really want to exercise my pop muscle a little bit more as actually because I grew up on pop music, but I think growing up, I felt like there wasn't really a place for me in pop music. I don't know. I, there's just a prototype of pop musician that you think you have to, they have to look this way, make a specific kind of music. So I think I kind of distanced myself from it because I, I, didn't really see myself in it or felt like I might not fit in it, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it's a, I grew up listening to quite a bit of pop music. And so now I think I'm older and I understand that, it, you know, 
everything is what you make it and you can be in any genre right and maintain or retain your essence as an artist and so i think there's a part of me that kind of wants to reclaim that for myself and go back into that space so there's this folklorist who's um drawing from folk tales there's this uh fusion soft rock girl there's this pop budding <laughs> pop artist yeah i love it I, w- I would actually love to see that of you because I don't know, from this conversation, from uh, hearing your approach to your art, I feel like you could actually do anything that you want to do. And especially when you have such a powerful instrument, your voice as it is. Um, I think after the album, you had a string of collaborations, successful collaborations. If you look back at all the collaborations you've had, which were some of your favorite um, and why and with which artists? I definitely would cite the collaboration with Malay as my favorite thus far just because it was such a full circle moment um when I was she is an artist who um is from Lesotho as well uh was raised a lot in South Africa but you know she's got family there she's very much draws from you know Lesotho as a place right um in her art and she was one of the first people who ignited that sense of possibility in me that I could make music in Sesotho, right? I remember the moment of discovering her music. I was helping, I was um, volunteering at a festival, at a music festival, and she was one of the artists performing. And I just have such a vivid memory of seeing her on the stage and experiencing her for the first time. And she was singing in Sesotho and I was like, who is that, (laughs) right? And I think I just made a mental note at the time that I wanted to work with her. So fast forward all these years later, um, her, someone from her team actually approached us because she was working on an album and wanted to collaborate with more artists, uh, Basuto artists, mm-hmm. right? So just how that was a full circle moment from me discovering her and having this courage and light bulb moment that, okay, because there's always been music in Susutu, but a lot of it, there was a gap, I think, between when music in Susutu was popular mm-hmm. and what's coming out now yes there's a there's a specific genre called famo which is like the accordion music and it's kind of like rap over an accordion it's very cool <laughs> i'm learning famo from 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 lesotho yeah. yes very much the m- music of like the the miners very much music of um the what are they the the herd boys as well so it's just yeah but um it's it's a it's very specific like growing up As a young person, I didn't associate that music as like urban or, you know, music. So I couldn't really bridge the gap between I want to make music in Sesotho, but what would that sound like? What would a modern Sesotho music sound be? And Malay was one of the people who made me think, oh, wait. So that collaboration was just, it's it's very dear to me. Did you have a chance, you know, to share this with her, you know, when you finally got a chance to work with her that you made me see a possibility in being myself and doing this thing about this, bridging the music. Why did you ever get a chance to share that with her? Over and over. I tell, I tell her all the time and like the modest okay. artist, she like brushes it off and it's like, Oh, okay. Really? Thank you. I'm so glad. So nice. mm-hmm. and I think previously, um, before we started the interview, you talked about your collaborative producer who you have been collaborating with for long and writing music as well together. Tell me more about this and, um, the future of, you know, upcoming, you know, songs. Mm-hmm and um, recordings or collaborations? So I think on my first album, I didn't really have a producer. What happened was I wrote the music, we started performing it with a band, and then we just kind of recorded the music as we had interpreted it together, um, myself and the band that I was playing with, right? And I was very specific that I moving forward, I want to collaborate with producers because I really think there is, there's just a value, it's like, it's like writing a book and having an editor, right? There's this value that they bring to just kind of, you know, assisting with how to, um, how to, inter- how to build the sound, right? The sound of the music and, um, they might have, you know, notes on arrangements. They might, um, hear something that you might have not. So I'm really excited, um, that I've been working with Neo Muyanga because, um, he's just not, he just gets it. <laughs> he just gets it. And I think a lot of my, my music making process is also part of it is intuitive. Part of it is the actual creating of the work. And then part of it is very cerebral and like maybe research based sometimes. And so 
Um, I just enjoy collaborating with Neo Muyanga so much because he's so vast as a musician and he will like engage me on like my thought process behind the music. There are some producers who speak just music and that's a beautiful thing too. But there are some producers who are like, no, 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 no. I like I hear your backstory, <laughs> but let's find it in the music. Yeah. And so I just, I really enjoy him because he indulges all sides of me. So he indulges like, okay, sonically, what are you trying to build? But he also then indulges like, what's the story behind and i find that to be quite important as well because like ideas might spark from there for him as well as a producer that oh that's the story you're trying to tell you know sometimes i might be trying to tell a certain story but not necessarily have the music language to articulate that right mm. and so having that person that can bridge the thought and the music and try and make it come alive is so beautiful and he's just yeah he's a, a super he's he can make all types of music um, and I just enjoy him very much. Fantastic. How is it being a, um, an artist from Lesotho operating in South Africa? Do you have any challenges just because you're not originally from here or nobody really cares? Because I think the country itself is so diverse. I see a lot of artists making it here, but I, I think um, I still see more of the top artists being from South Africa. So how has the experience been for you as a Lesotho artist in this space? Um, so I think some of the challenges um, might be more from um, like a, well, I don't know what the word to describe this would be, but for example, Lesotho is its own independent country, right? As much as it's surrounded by South Africa. So when I, um, when I just finished studying, I was on a study permit and I didn't have a, a permit to be here. So I would travel back and forth between South Africa and Lesotho like monthly to go get like <laughs> another permit and another permit. So those kind of challenges from, but then of course I, I have a permit that allows me to be here for much longer now. Um, and then, for the most part, if I don't say that I'm from Lesotho, I think because there are Basotho in South Africa as well, I could very much pass for <laughs> being from, um, from South Africa. Um, although I will say that a lot of Johannesburg people pick up very quickly that even when I'm speaking Sesotho, that it's a specific kind of Sesotho. There's certain words that have kind of like been phased out in yeah. South Africa, I think, because there's so many languages. So there's certain words that are still used back in Lesotho that are not so much here. So people will be like, wait, you speak Lesotho, but you don't sound like you speak the Lesotho from here. Um, and then in terms of musically, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't necessarily think that any of the challenges that I might face as a musician in terms of navigating the industry and collaborations or climbing up, so to speak, are related to my being from Lesotho, I don't necessarily think that. From from East Africa, from Kenya, it does seem like, you know, there's a real movement here when it comes to um, some big genres which have taken over globally that, you know, come from South Africa, for instance, I'm a piano, Afro house. Um, how do you see that benefiting, you know, you, the artist, and the, the artists and the artists who are based in this industry? Um, have some genres become so um, dominant that maybe there's not enough room for the rest of the artists or how do you view the state of um, the industry in relation to the various genres and especially those that are emerging? Um, I do think it's a really beautiful time. I do think I love how the world is getting smaller. I love how People are just interested in music from all over and it's not necessarily seen as this strange category of world music, yeah. right? But that like music that is popular in Southern Africa can be um, just as popular and mainstream in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it's an exciting time for artists to know that their music can be kind of enjoyed and celebrated at the same level of the, mm -hmm. uh, as the artists that maybe have recent um, previously been celebrated. Um, and then at the same time, I, I do think that there's always that danger of, again, like you're saying, that particular genre is being prioritized because I, I find no offense to record labels. If they want to give me money, please give me money. But I'm about to say that I find that they can be very, um, um, very tunnel visioned in how, like when one thing is flourishing and making money, then they kind of want to hold it. There's no sense of, um, uh, 
it's almost like a scarcity mentality where there's no sense of possibility or that many different things can be big at once mm. so then there does become this pressure for people to all make i'm a piano right so i've seen we've seen so many artists who were previously famed for other genres kind of feeling the need to quickly enter that like i'm a piano tunnel because they're like oh my goodness this thing is taking off and i need you know my piece of that pie um so i do find that then you know the people behind who are making the decisions about like who to fund and what to prioritize well then prioritize those festivals or you know because that's the music that seems lucrative on the moment mm -hmm. and it would be lovely to just kind of have people who are a little more open-minded and understand that many things can exist at the same time right and that um in the same way that i'm a piano is kind of flourishing right now um many other different styles of music can flourish if they're given the support that they needed um as somebody who's in the industry i know that it's my responsibility to discover you know i can't be like it's not happening or i don't know but i have to go out and find it so it's such an honor to be able to meet with you to speak with you um and to see the work that you're doing and congratulations for sticking true to yourself your your brand your music your um lesotho culture it's so dope um from Le from lesotho to the world i'm very thankful to have spoken to you vip access, VIP access. with aniko on africa loud